In a couple of weeks' time, uh, I have the privilege of going again to our lovely friends and partners in southwest Kenya, Karicha Darsis, with another team from uh, here. We have this wonderful partnership. We'll be joining in with their missions team, reaching out into uh, kind of rural areas where they're looking to plant yet another church. I think it's number 140-something in 16 years that we've known them. They're amazing. We'll be looking to encourage some believers in church settings uh, to minister in some schools, in the Compassion Center, Mazarura, especially where some of you will have uh, sponsored kids through the, through the Compassion Program. And doing all of that is going to be wonderful and um, we're excited about that and very blessed by that amazing opportunity. So imagine that a week on Friday, I get on the plane at Heathrow, we take off, I have a nice British Airways cup of coffee or maybe even something stronger, who knows, I have a nap and it's a little time later I wake up and it's, it, I wake up to a strange sight. Uh, there's a lot of frantic activity in the plane, there's some people running up and down even, the aisle. Uh, there's some others doing kind of star jumps on the spot, and it's all very sort of sweaty and frantic, and even the people in their seats next to me, they're sort of puffing and panting and flapping their wings, and, 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 and I reach over to my neighbor and say, what on earth's going on? And he says, well, isn't it obvious? <clears throat> you see, we, we got off the ground okay, but now we all need to keep this thing in the air, so why aren't you helping? I wonder if you know <laughs> where this is going this morning. Uh, we've been given uh, True Faith as the title for this message in this series of messages that we're doing from Paul's letter to the Galatians, kind of modern central Turkey around that kind of era. Incredibly foundational teaching to deepen our rootedness in Jesus. And uh, chapters one and two so far. And, and by the way, I do encourage us to, if you've missed out, please kind of catch up. And I think we'll get the most out of this series as a church together if we're supplementing Sunday messages with our own kind of reading and studying and grappling and meditating, whether that's by yourself or in your groups or with, with twos or whatever. Just want to say that. But here's Paul. So without going too much of a recap, one and two in, in the chapters, he's been taking them back to the beginning of their story, reminding them of their history. They've embraced it eagerly when they first came uh, to hear the good news about Jesus from the lips of the Apostle Paul himself, authorized by God, this gospel of stunning, outrageous grace, he says, that says that in his immense love, the Father himself wants every single one of us to be freed from the prisons that we ourselves imprison ourselves in, of our own Pride, sinfulness, rebellion against God, all of those kinds of things. He wants to free us, rescue us from, from that, save us from our attempts to find life anywhere else, to do life without him, and that we can be. This is possible, gloriously. And we celebrate it daily and here in special ways because Jesus the Son has sacrificed himself. He's paid the price for all of that stuff, all of our stuff, by his blood, on the cross. That's the gospel. He's opened, us, opened the way for us to be forgiven and freed and brought into the family of the Father where we belong and what we were made for. And then to find new purpose within it and sharing that love with others and so on. No longer orphans, but now sons and daughters. He's been recapping on all of that. This is the true gospel. They embraced it. It's now under attack, says Paul. False teachers have come. We've heard some of that. They've given their subtly different messages. You can't really trust Paul. He's got some of it right, but he's actually got some of it wrong. And really, you need to do this and you need to do that. And there's some things you aren't doing, some purity things, some, some eating things, some Sabbath things. And so Paul lays all of this out in, in the first couple of chapters. Recap if you need to begins to address it, these distortions to what he calls the true gospel, the real gospel, these additions that you need. Uh, he counters their objections that he's getting it wrong or that there's some sort of split between him and the big bosses back in Jerusalem. Uh, they're questioning his authority. It's all wrong. You've got that wrong. Anything, he says, anything other than this simple gospel with which you were first presented, anything is not a gospel at all. It's not even false. It's not a gospel at all. With, by the way, the strong and rather provocative implication that if we believe a false gospel, then can we really claim to be followers at all? So he's warm to his theme, chapters 1 and 2, and now he explodes. <laughs> Chapter 3, and I think this is the core of the letter in many ways. You bunch of absolute muppets. I thought about starting this message like that this morning. <laughs> I did, actually. I wonder how that would go down. I chickened out. But can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine you know, receiving the letter and the guy's reading it? 
it says here, <laughs> you absolute muppets, you idiots, you know. Could somebody else want to read this letter? Let's not miss, miss it, though, or just laugh at us. I'm, I'm sure that it came out of Paul's compassion, his fierce, I mean, he's a fierce guy, this fierce desire for this bunch of people, who he loves, not, not to get it so badly wrong. So let's not miss it or just laugh at us. You, uh, but, but worse, by the way, than being you know, morons, effectively, that's the word, he says, who has bewitched you? Beginning of chapter 3, we'll look at it in a minute. Literally, he's saying there's something demonic here. There is something demonic about the path that you are taking, and you must wake up to it. That's strong, isn't it? Bewitched. It's deliberate. Go back to the plane. So why are you flapping around on the plane, he's saying. It took off perfectly well by itself without your help. So why on earth do you think now that you need to start adding your effort to keep it afloat? So verse 3, it's the focus. That's my paraphrase. Here's what verse 3 actually says. Here is the whole problem that he's addressing here, the core of this chapter. After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Let's actually read the first five verses. It's all we're going to read. I want to really encourage you to read the rest of, of the chapter. But the first five are the kind of foundation of it. He then kind of gives examples. Oh, foolish Galatians, in this version, this is the NLT, who has cast an evil spell on you? Strong language. For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. So let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Did the plane take off because you pedaled really, really fast? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Jesus. The plane took off because of the work of the engineers and the pilot, and you trusted that work. So how foolish can you be, verse 3, after starting your new life in the Spirit, Trusting in the work of Jesus received through faith. Why are you now paddling fast? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much, all that you've experienced so far, in vain? For nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? So I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Jesus. Can I paraphrase some of Paul's questions, at least, under one big, bigger question, an umbrella question for, for today's purposes? What do you need faith for? I want to capture it like that. What do you need faith for? Deliberate double meaning, if you like. Literally, why do you need faith at all? What do you need it for? Why do you need faith? Why do you need it at all? And then, if you like, secondary meaning in there. Are there some things, what things in your life require faith? Where, where are you exercising faith in relation to things? I wonder how you might even begin to answer that question for yourself right now. I'm going to lob out what I feel God has told me to lob out, but I'd, I'd love us to take that question away. What do you need faith for? So one main headline and then just a few smaller ones. Here's the main one, verse, verses 1 to 5. The way in is the way on. The way in is the way on. The way into this whole new life, says Paul, being a follower of Jesus, it's by grace. It's the free gift of God. And how do we receive it? There's only one way. Paul says it again and again and again through this letter. So we don't have to cast our eyes far down the chapter. By the way, do get the chapter up on your devices or, or, or in a book. Drop down to verse 22, for example. Here's the nearest reference. We are prisoners of sin. That's our own independence, self-centeredness. So we receive God's promise of freedom. Here's the word, only by believing in Jesus. In other words, only by faith, it's the same word. Only by trust, it's the same word. By trusting that finished work of Jesus on the cross and that it's effective for me. And I contribute nothing to that. We've heard it before a thousand times probably. But I keep needing to hear it again and so do they. Ephesians 2, different way of saying it. Paul said it here. NLT version, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for it. It's the gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done. So none of us can boast about it. That's the way in. But what Paul stresses here and in all his letters is there's then a lifetime of transformation. Standing, just getting into the doorway and standing there is, is no good. There's a whole lifetime of transformation to come. There's a whole lifetime of getting to know Jesus and becoming more like him and fulfilling our, 
our assignment here on earth before we meet him one day in glory. Paul's so massive about the idea of growing up, go from milk to meat, get mature, and on and on, get more rooted. And his grace to us, received by our faith in him, his grace to us, received by our faith in him, is the way in, but it's also, Paul is saying, the way on. Nothing has changed in becoming more and more like Jesus. So we're not, along with the Galatians, to fall for this demonic lie that says, yeah, we've been saved by grace in the past, but now, now we need to live by works. Now we need to try hard. Now we need to pedal fast. Now we need to, to grow by, you know, scurrying around furiously and, and keeping the plane in the air. No, a thousand times no, he says. Can't say it strongly enough. You're morons if you think that, he says. In fact, you're going down a demonic path if you think that. This is so tough to grasp. Head scratching, isn't it? It's so hard to grasp for Galatians and frankly for Cheltonians. Why? Because grace is a scandal. It is utterly outrageous. It's so unfair. It's so offensive, actually, at times to us. Why? Because we're hardwired that to get something, we need to give something. It's just hardwired in us. To get something, we need to give something. We need there to be a cost. We're suspicious of freebies. We need there to be a cost so that it feels valid. But God, as I often say, is not selling. I read a story this week of a man uh, who was burgled. Somebody came into his garage and stole his car. And um, in a combination of CCTV cameras and, and security cameras and Facebook, he tracked down um, the, 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 the name of the... Actually, sorry, I should have said, sometime later, sorry, the car was found in the center of town. And there was a message on it saying, sorry, I stole your car. So the car gets stolen, sorry, I stole your car. With, with security, CCTV, whatever, uh, he finds uh, the name of uh, the thief. The owner does. Now, if he wanted, and he, went, and he goes down into, into town to try and find him, and if he wanted justice, then the owner would have reported the guy to the police and pressed charges. Fair enough. That's justice, getting what he deserves. If the owner wanted to be merciful, he would have let him off completely and forgiven him. Mercy, not getting what he deserves, what we deserve. That's mercy. But this guy wanted to show grace. And that is in a whole new league. I think I've got a, a slide of that. Some, some, who's on? Who's on? Oh, James, thank you, James. Justice, mercy, grace. Grace is in a whole new league. He wanted to show grace. He wanted to find the man in order to give him the car. And maybe chat to him a bit and maybe just pray that an act of grace might move the thief towards Jesus. And all the thief would need to do in that circumstance, isn't it, is to trust that the car owner, the giver of grace, wasn't going to trick him or demand something from him in return. He just needed to receive the gift. I thought that was a beautiful example of grace. And God is always tracking people down. He's tracked you and me down. He's always about that business of tracking people down and extending his scandalous grace and praying that somehow they will simply trust him in return enough to receive it. Grace is the way, on, the way in. You can't be saved. You can't join the, fa- the Father's family any other way. But it's also the way on. Which is where Paul's saying we're getting stuck. Grace isn't this one-time offer. It's who he is. It's how he has made us to relate to him all the time. It's what he gives us daily. Paul says in in another letter, doesn't he, 2 Corinthians 12, we love this. My grace, Jesus' grace, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. In other words, especially when you you feel like trusting your own peddling power. And you're you're scurrying around like the hamster in the wheel and it's not going very well. No, no, remember, my power works best in weakness. Here's grace, biblical grace. Some people call it undeserved favor. I think that's a weak weak way of saying it. it. It is that, but it's more than that. Note in the verse there, there's power attached to grace. Grace is power. Sure, it's undeserved. We don't deserve anything, but it's power to make things different. And how is the power Paul is, uh, Paul is stressing in the whole of this chapter, arguably the whole book, how is that power, the power of grace, released to us when, when, we, when we first came in, and let alone the way on in our journey, by faith, by trusting the grace giver again and again and again and again and deepening in that trust. You've heard of grave robbers so second, Paul says, well, beware the grace robbers. That's how I like to phrase it this morning. Beware the grace robbers. What would prevent us then receiving this grace? Well, 
Most of this chapter is about the, the prime one, trying to keep God's rules instead of growing in relationship with him. Trying to keep the rules instead of growing in relationship. Why? Because rule keeping seems so much simpler, frankly, than relationship forming, doesn't it? One of our children, in particular, a number of times over the years when he, that narrows it down from four to three, <laughs> would say in his frustration, just tell me what to do. He's wired in a kind of fairly black and white, unnuanced kind of a way, straightforward, you know, linear thinker. Just tell me what to do. I find there's all this sort of relationship stuff. It's so uncertain and messy and complicated. Just tell me. He'd be so frustrated when we wouldn't you know, tell him, invite him into the, the mess of relationship. Why? Well, let's face it. A list of rules and regulations as your guide for everyday living is quite appealing, isn't it? Because you feel more in control that way. Seems a lot simpler than basing your life in messy relationship with a living God who you can't see that requires this regular daily kind of conversation with the Holy Spirit, wondering if you're hearing him right and whom you can't see, let alone control. But, says Paul to the, screams Paul to the Galatians, to trust in rule keeping, which is essentially trusting in yourself, actually, keeping control, and not trusting in the Lord. So to rely on works and not grace, to rely on the flesh or operate in the flesh and not the spirit, to operate in willpower rather than the power of the spirit, is to subject yourself, he's saying, to the very thing that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from doing. I find that shockingly powerful. The next grace, grace robber is, would, would be fear, briefly. It would be that sense of unworthiness, that sense I'm simply not worthy to receive any kind of free gift from the Lord, let alone you know, these amazing promises and resources and so on. Well, that's kind of the point. And we have to get over it, friends. We are unworthy. We don't deserve it, but Jesus died to fix all of that. He took our unworthiness, our um, uncleanness, our unrighteousness at the cross and gave us in exchange what? His worthiness, his cleanness, his righteousness. That's the whole gospel. That's the point, this divine exchange. Pride is the opposite grace robber, of course, when we think somehow we do deserve it because we come from Cheltenham and we're British and we're very educated and nice people and quite well behaved and, and that sort of thing. Look how well I've, I'm doing, Lord. My, right at the moment, my quiet times are on track. My prayer life's in shape, I'm fasting, I'm tithing, I'm serving, my journal is full of notes. I've not run down any of my escape routes for a long time, I'm not doing the binge drinking, binge scrolling, binge porn, binge whatever else my escape routes might be. I'm doing really well, so you must be really pleased with me, so why are you not coming through for me in this area uh, that I'd love to see breakthrough in? What's gone wrong? Has, what's wrong with me? That's pride, friends, and it's a grace robber. Here's Paul in, in the, amplified, the Tim Amplified version of verse 5. I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you and give you his grace, all of which you've experienced in beautiful ways? Did he do all of that? Does he do all of that because you behave well and because you've been obeying the law and, and peddling fast? Of course not. It's because of faith. You believe the gospel message you heard about Jesus and you've trusted him. So don't be idiots starting down this demonic path. Strong again. What do you need faith for? Back to that question. What do you need faith for? Well, there's a big clue uh, here, isn't there? What do you need faith for? Uh, it, Hebrews 11.6, I was reminded of that interesting at Hills, started with that this morning. Um, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's pretty sharp, isn't it? Don't stop cultivating faith, says Paul. Faith is for life. Literally, it's for life. You get life through faith. Verse 11 of our, our own passage here, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. As a reminder, just before I came up, when the Son of Man comes, I think it's Luke 18, will he find, you know the next word, what will he find? When the Son of Man comes, what will he find on the earth? And we're thinking, is it good behavior? Is it kind of, you know, I, I kept a tidy garden or something? No, 
Will he find faith when he comes? That's what he's after. It's the thing he most wants, that sense of us connecting with his grace by faith. His priority more than anything else on earth. But it's for life, it's from beginning to end. There's a sense of progression, of course there is. Um, he's not wanting to make, I think, the Galatians or, or us feel sort of, oh my goodness, you know, my faith is, is miserable. No, it, we understand there's a journey. He's just saying, go, do the right journey. <laughs> go down the faith, the faith grace road, not the, not the works self-control mode. Uh, so it's about faith from beginning to end, third little headline. In 6 to 19, chapter 3, I'm going to do this very briefly. He just gives this example from, from history, our own history, their history, the figure of Abraham to show that that faith has actually always been at the heart of how the Lord intends for us to do life with him and relate to him. It's not rule-keeping. Paul is saying, don't misunderstand the Old Testament. Don't misunderstand the Old Scriptures. Don't think that the Old Testament is all about making God pleased by keeping the law, and the New Testament is all about making him pleased by exercising faith. Why? Look back to Abraham. What was Abraham given? An incredible promise. You'll be the father of many nations. All nations will be blessed through you. We know that in Genesis. Everyone will be blessed through you. Did he deserve it? No. Had he earned it? No. What did he have to do to see it fulfilled? Anything? Do some stuff? Get circumcised? Obey, obey things? No. There's just one thing he had to do. Trust God. Trust the promise giver. Exercise faith. And that's what he did. Trust that what God had said would happen would happen, not because of Abraham's performance, but because of the nature of a loving, powerful, faithful God, whom we've been celebrating in his faithfulness today. And sure, Abraham wasn't perfect. He wavered. He went down that route for a while. He tried the whole Ishmael thing. God's not doing it, so I'm going to have to do it. Tried the whole Ishmael thing. That didn't work out very well. But he came back to faith, and and God delivered. And there's Isaac. He trusted God, even at a time, I mean, the clue's in the name, Abraham, father of many, trusted God at a time when he had no sons and his wife had no chance of giving birth. And so did the law, which came 400 years after that, did that change anything in this respect? No. Why? Because the promises of God have always and only been accessed by faith. They can't be accessed any other way. If I I pedal really, really fast, God's promise will come through. No. Just by faith. But it's an active faith, though. There needs to be evidence of it. Rob uh, was standing here last week sharing with us a little bit the story of being on the verge of bankruptcy with, his, uh, with Katie, his wife, choosing to trust that God would provide. There's a promise God's going to provide. They chose to trust that promise. That's his promise. And the evidence of their trust was, as they were you know, thinking about it all, praying about it, all they sensed the Lord asking to them to enter the blessing of regular, generous giving, tithing, at this very moment when their resources were at rock bottom. And they chose to do so. And in time... Things turned around, uh, Rob was saying, didn't he? And, and, and God has been more than faithful to that promise to provide. Why? Because of Rob and Katie's performance behavior? No. There was some evidence of that. But because they chose to trust the promise and to lean into grace and to exercise faith and to surrender outcomes and control to the Lord. Promises, the promises are accessed by faith. Abraham trusted God. Whatever the evidence of the circumstances in front of his eyes. And it was that faith, says the Bible. You know the verse, it's in our text today. That was credited to him as righteousness. I love this bit. So in this bit where Paul's kind of expanding on this, he says, so therefore, the true sons of, and daughters of Abraham, who are they? There's this argument going on about, you know, theologically about who, who, are the son, who are the true sons? Is it Gentiles, Jews, you know, whatever, whatever. No, the true sons of Abraham are those who exercise this kind of faith. That's it. They're united, identified only by faith in Jesus, not by genetics or race or, or, or gender, or status, or nationality, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, it's a, that, that's at the bottom of this chapter. Now that you belong to Christ, how? Through faith, verse 29. You are the true children of Abraham, you're his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you, to us, Cheltonians. Last little headline, it's not mental agreement. Faith can't be mental agreement follows, obviously, doesn't it? And there's lots of overlapping material here. Uh, we could argue that these chairs here that we're, we're sitting on, they're pretty strong. Uh, they look good. They stack well. They cost a fortune, by the way, a few years ago. <laughs> they don't break. But to agree all of that is not the same as trusting the chair to take your weight. You only actually exercise faith 
when you go beyond that, not that any of you did this morning, you immediately exercise faith and you, put your, you parked your behind on the, the chair and it didn't collapse. You lent into faith in that way. To agree mentally with God's promises is not the same as putting your full weight on them, is it? And Paul is really going for this. To trust the Lord then. To have confidence in him that he's going to keep his promise even when things around us are pretty rubbish and they don't seem to be going in a good direction. Well, that is incredibly challenging. Incredibly challenging. I'm not going to minimize anything that anybody's going through, the pain of of challenging circumstances. But I think this is unbelievably key and it feels like the Lord... I've come across this in the last fortnight more than I have for a long period of time. This business of of whether our, the extent to which our trust in God is linked with our circumstances or not. Simon Gilbo, mission partner here, we know Simon, he's doing this incredible podcast, do get on it if you're not. He, he interviewed Jackie Pullinger last week. Uh, you know the story of Jackie if you don't ask somebody. And, and, and she told this story that when she first arrived in Hong Kong in the 60s, um, in the walled city, a big, uh, in that infamous place of crime and drugs and everything. She started this youth group and she, she, she felt the Lord say to her, as part of the, the weekly youth group, you need to, you know, playing table tennis and everything, but you need to worship God. You know, there needs to be a bit where you worship God every week. And every week, when it came to that period of time, the people in the youth group stepped out and started smoking weed and all, all the rest of it. And then they'd come back in later when it was over. Every week, for four years... There was nobody in the room for four years in her youth group, but she carried on because that's what God had told her to do. Because she trusted God. There's a real cruncher there for me. When my trust in God is directly linked to how well my life is going, I'm in for a very bumpy ride. It's sunny. He loves me. I'm ill. Where's he gone? I've got a new job. He's faithful. I've lost my job. He's abandoned me. The money's good. He's my provider. My kids are still far away from Jesus. Why on earth has the Lord not done something? Again, I don't want to minimize huge amounts of pain, even in places of great pain, great loss, bereavement, failing marriages, awful things, terrible pain. To continue to trust God... And not for my trust to be linked with whether things are going well or not is such a massive challenge. And what's it based on, friends? It's based on knowing. What did Jackie know? She knew that God was good. She knew God enough to know that he was good. Why would we trust anything? Why would we trust any promise? Because we have enough confidence that the person is trustworthy and that the promise is trustworthy. Fundamentally, it comes back to the the question which hangs over the whole of our faith from beginning to end. It's It's the big question in the garden, is God good? Jackie had learned that God was good. How? Through relationship, through learning, through recognizing grace, through allowing herself to develop in relationship rather than rule keeping. It's always the test, isn't it? It always comes back to that. How well do I know God? Is he my, priori- my highest priority? Is that relationship with him my highest priority? Because the extent to which I, I get to know God is the extent to which I get to know that he's good, and then I know that he's trustworthy, and then I know that his promises are secure, even when the evidence in front of my eyes at this moment looks terrible. How could Richard Wurmbrandt be joyful in prison for all those years in Romania? Tortured for Christ, some of you remember that book. Or people who suffer indescribably and yet, and yet carry on with the Lord. Is it because of their circumstances? Well, obviously not. It's because they know the Lord and they know his grace and they've received it by faith and that's where they're hanging their coat. By the way, after four years, guess what? (laughs) I would have lasted four days probably. It's not not working, Lord. I I need to try. I'm going to try something else. That wasn't a very good idea, God. I'm going to try my own idea. I'm going to start peddling. Try and fly the plane by my own effort. She didn't do that. After four years, what happens? A guy comes in. I, I won't tell you the story. Listen to the podcast. Um, he starts worshipping. The power of God hits him. He gets converted. He comes to faith in Jesus. He's an influential guy. Others follow. And over the years, the next 50 years, what? Thousands and thousands of addicts, drug 
dealers, gangsters and so on, have found faith in Jesus Christ in that hellhole in, in Hong Kong through those ministries, that faithful ministry, faith-filled ministry, people connecting to the grace of God through simple faith. See, grace is scandalous, friends. It's amazing, but it's scandalous. Hard won, freely given, ours to take hold of, and actually to go on taking hold of it daily. The way in is the way on. So let's reflect. The more that I receive and walk in the Savior's grace and lean into his promises and get rooted in his love because I spend time with him, cultivating relationship, rejecting legalism, rejecting rule keeping, rejecting the opposite, becoming sensitive to his voice through the Holy Scriptures, through the Holy Spirit together. Well, then the more I will live to please him And the more I and we together and the church across the land and the world will fulfill his purposes for us. Amen.